This is Dr. Mary Chamberlain, and I am here with Dr. Richard Selleck at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. Today is Thursday, August 11, 2016. I'm interviewing Dr. Selleck as part of the Oral History Project, The Early Years of AIDS, CDC's response to an historic epidemic. We're here to discuss your experiences during the early years of CDC's work on what would become known as AIDS. Dr. Selleck, do I have your permission to interview you and to record this interview? Yes, you do. Thank you. So Richard, you began your CDC career as an Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer, or EIS officer, from 1978 to 1980. And within a year of finishing the EIS program, you moved to the Venereal Disease Control Division of CDC. That was just about the time of the initial MMWR report of pneumocystis carinii pneumonia in homosexual men was published in June of 1981. And very soon after that, you began to work on this newly emerging disease, which later became known as AIDS. However, before we talk about AIDS, let's begin by having you tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, your early family life, where you went to college and medical school? Yes, well, I was born and grew up in Detroit, Michigan. Um, we eventually moved to the suburbs, but then I, I went to college and medical school at Wayne State University in Detroit. Uh, and, and then I, uh, I, I decided to move to New York City for my internship and residency um, and uh, at the time I chose to take a residency in obstetrics and gynecology and that was because I had planned to have a career that would try to do something about uh, the uh, population problem the, uh, the population explosion as some people call it uh, because I, I became concerned about it at that time. Um, and uh, this was around the time uh, when uh, we had uh, world, uh, uh, the, uh, it was the uh, environmental concern at that time. I, f I forgot actually what, what it, on April 22nd every year, it, it, uh, we celebrate this day of, uh, and I forgot the term for it, but it's uh, uh, it, it, it's concern about the environment mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. ecology, preventing pollution, and as part of that, uh, I had uh, uh, be advocated that we should also uh, be concerned about uh, excessive population growth because the population of the Earth of, of people is uh, was. In, growing exponentially. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I was, for that reason, I asked experts uh, wh what would be the best way or what kind of education or training for me to contribute to helping solve this problem. And they said, oh, become an obstetrician and gynecologist and, and go into family planning. Hmm. Well. So I took their advice, but it actually uh, may not have been the best choice for me because temperamentally I, I was not suited to be a surgeon and I, I didn't like to get up in the middle of the night to deliver babies. And uh, I was more interested in doing something that would um, make a contribution to society at large rather than treating individual patients. Uh, and so uh, I decided after finishing my residency to join the CDC Family Planning Evaluation Division. And uh, there I became an, an EIS officer mm -hmm. and my uh, uh, supervisor there was Ward Cates and uh, he was the head of the abortion surveillance branch there and above him was Carl Tyler, the, the head of the uh, Family Planning Evaluation Division, which is now called the Div Division of Reproductive Health. Uh, 
And uh, so I was there for uh, the two years of my EIS mm -hmm. service. Can I just, can we maybe just stop here and let me ask you a few follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. So had you, had you decided at a fairly young age that you wanted to be a physician? Were, was there any particular person or other inspiration for a career well, in medicine? Well, uh, I wanted to do science. I wanted to be a scientist. Mm. I was interested in that. Uh, growing up, I, I, I was reading science fiction, mm -hmm. and uh, so I, I, I thought maybe I would like to be a paleontologist and study dinosaurs or, or, or other kinds of monsters. Um, so, or maybe... Uh, Did you major in science at, uh, in college? Uh, well, I did a pre-medical uh, okay. type of uh, major. Uh, well, before, well, so let me back up a little bit. So, so I was always interested in science and, and, uh, and how science could make a, a contribution to society. And, uh, and my, my father would say, okay, it's fine you can, for, for, to be a PhD scientist, but if you want to be assured of a steady income stream, you should become a physician. And then after you get your MD, then you can go be a scientist. And so he influenced me to go to medical school. And uh, so that answers your question of why mm -hmm. in particular I, I decided to be a, a, a physician or a, a get an MD. Um, and then you were asking me about uh, the major, what major I took? Yeah, you pursued three Well, meds, I so. actually, uh, I was also interested in philosophy and uh, and uh, history and uh, and at the time that I started college, they they at Wayne State University they had a special sort of uh, experimental college that they created in which uh, they said that it, it would you you would not have to major in a narrow particular field. You could, uh, you could just have a broad uh, exposure to uh, g the um, general um, events that happened. They, they had, uh, part of their courses were in uh, what you might call sociology. Uh, another part was in the history and, and philosophy of science. Uh, and, and so they had a, uh, uh, a kind of broader view of the core curriculum that a, a well-rounded person should have, and that appealed to me at the time. So uh, the disadvantage in going to Monteith College was that they didn't give you a traditional degree at the end, like a BA, or, uh, and so uh, it, it, was, it was a bachelor's degree, but they called it something else, and so it didn't uh, it wasn't exactly comprehensible to other people. Um, and another thing was that e even though I had high grades, they didn't qualify for Phi Beta Kappa for some reason because of the, they were a new school that had been untested. So, um, so anyway, so that's, I went from there into, into medical school. And then as I explained from there into a, a residency in obstetrics and gynecology, which was in New York City because I thought, oh, New York City would be in more interesting than Detroit. Um, and uh, it, it was. What but, hospital in New York City? Uh, it, it was at the, uh, the residency was at the Mount Sinai Hospital. But eventually uh, I was, it came, became kind of disillusioned with New York City because of the, the noise and the, and the air pollution with a lot of particulate matter in the air that, uh, and uh, I was glad to move to Atlanta, to where the air seemed to be cleaner, except for the yellow pine pollen, and, <laughs> and, and, um, and there were a lot of trees and flowers that it, uh, made Atlanta look much more appealing. Uh, and so I worked. So you did your two years in the abortion surveillance. Band. That's right. And then I think you 
uh, did a preventive medicine That's residency, right. so you had another year. There was an extra year um, that year. was, it was still part of the family planning eval uh, evaluation division uh, sponsored by them, but I worked in, the, in a health department at the New Jersey Health Department in the Division of Maternal and Child Health. And after that, I was planning to come back to the Family Planning Evaluation Division. But at that time, uh, President Reagan had come into office, and uh, he was uh, trying to downsize uh, the activities of CDC. And uh, I was told they actually didn't have any positions for me to come back to at the Family Planning Evaluation Division. And that division was also somewhat controversial because uh, being involved with uh, contraception and abortion and things like that, there were members of Congress that didn't like that kind of activity. Um, so, but they told me that uh, the, what was called the venereal disease control division may have a, an opening for me, and they, fortunately they did. So I thought, well, that seems like it fits my background uh, in obstetrics and gynecology, so I thought, okay, I'll try that. So I was with that uh, division, and actually it was Jim Curran who hired me to join him there. Unfortunately, when I got there, he was no longer going to be my supervisor, uh, because instead, he, as you know, he became uh, in charge of the what was called the uh, task Force on Kaposi's Sarcoma and Opportunistic Infections. Uh, so, uh, so uh, I had How some... long was it before you got hooked on to the task force? Well, uh, the, some of the meetings of the task force were, uh, uh, were open to us, and mm -hmm. so we, we could hear kind of weekly or at least monthly what was going on there. But for the most part, our activities in the uh, venereal disease or what we now call the STD division uh, were completely separate. We, we were uh, looking at um, gonorrhea uh, epidemiology, syphilis epidemiology, but not at what Jim Curran was working on. Uh, and uh, so, and, and the work was interesting, but uh, about six months after our th uh, that, uh, the, the task force on Kaposi sarcoma and opportunistic infections, uh, so they needed to recruit additional members. So I was volunteered to join them, uh, along with Peter Drotman and several other people who were working for uh, the STD division, and um, and I, I, right away I found that a lot more exciting and interesting. Yeah, I was going to ask you um, if you can reflect back. So we're talking about the end of 1981, early 1982. What was the atmosphere like working on the task force? Just as you said, a new uh, mysterious disease. Can you? Think back about what that was like in terms of your your uh, uh, sense of things and other people that you were working around. Well, it, it was uh, intriguing, exciting because uh, this disease was a mystery, and it was fatal. You know, and uh, death it always draws attention, like they say about newspapers that if if it bleeds, it leads, and uh, and so. And uh, also, uh, the fact that it was a fatal disease made it seem much more important that, compared with somebody getting a case of gonorrhea, for example. Um, and so we felt like we were working on something important, some, something that was uh, uh, needed a lot of uh, investigation, and, and it was a, a complete mystery about the cause of it. We had meetings chaired by Paul Wiesner, who was the uh, head of the Division of uh, Venereal Disease, and, and where we'd, we would brainstorm about what could possibly be the cause. And Harry Haverkoss's uh, favorite theory was that it was caused by uh, nitrite uh, in, inhalants or poppers that uh, gay men would take. Um, and uh, other people thought it was just uh, 
overexposure to too many different pathogens, uh, bacterial pathogens. Um, so uh, nobody knew exactly. Uh, some people thought it was an environmental thing. And uh, so that, that was uh, to give you an idea of, of why it was exciting. When you were volunteered to work on the task force, were you given some initial duties or responsibilities? Yes, my main responsibility to start out with was to, um, to develop the AIDS case definition because up till then, uh, it, it was, of course, it was called Kaposi sarcoma. That part was clear. But the opportunistic infections were not so clear. How do you know whether an infection is opportunistic? We didn't really have a clear-cut list of the infections that should be considered indicative of AIDS. So what I did at first was I read books on opportunistic infections to try to figure out which infections um, were like most likely to occur in people with a uh, immunodeficiency. And uh, so I made a list uh, and, uh, the, of several of these that I read in the textbook are infections that tend to occur more frequently in people who, whose immune systems have been uh, suppressed by chemotherapy for cancer or by corticosteroids for some other disease. And, um, or for, uh, for immunosuppressives for transplants. These kinds of people were getting a lot of the same diseases that people uh, with AIDS were getting. So uh, I selected several of those uh, to include as opportunistic infections in the AIDS case definition. And, and it was a little tough at times to, to, to decide what should go in and what should be left out. Uh, and at the beginning, uh, we uh, in, I included some that ultimately we took out, uh, such as uh, nocardiosis and aspergillosis and, and strongyloidiasis, uh, so that um, it was changing over time. And uh, So there must have been a lot of internal debates and discussions about coming up with this first formal case definition, did, how long a period of time did it take for, I think the first definition came, the first formal definition came out in September 1982. Can you recall how long it took to, to get you to the point where you were ready to, CDC was ready to put out a definition and the controversies well, if there were any? Before I did that, there was kind of a working definition that was loose, uh, or, uh, which had been used for the case control uh, project that Bill Darrell and Harold Jaffe worked on. Uh, but so when I tried to formalize the definition, uh, even though we had this formal working definition uh, that I had de designed, uh, we were kind of reluctant to publicize it because Jim Curran felt that if we tell physicians what is not included, then they might not report to us uh, some cases that he thought maybe they should report to us. Uh, and ultimately, it turned out that there were some additional conditions uh, that we learned about that uh, that we added to the case definition. Maybe physicians might not have reported if we had told them what was in and what was out. So, um, so we didn't really publicize uh, the case definition, although in an early article, it, there, a list of the diseases that I included was in a footnote. Mm -hmm. And that particular article uh, was requested, reprints of it were requested, not because of the, the main body of the text, but just for that footnote. <laughs> and um, so, but later on, uh, a few years later, uh, at the, around the same time that WHO publicized its case definition, we 
did publicize uh, the, uh, a full case definition uh, in the uh, in the MMWR. Mm -hmm. So this is pretty tricky because obviously this is taking place in 1982, well before an, the cause of AIDS, a virus, has been discovered. Right. And uh, my sense is 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 that there was a real interest in developing a case definition that was very specific. That's right. Can it, you ex and, first and of all explain a little bit yeah, about because what we that did not meant know, and why? We did not know the cause uh, of, it, of, it, of AIDS. We could only define it in terms of its manifestations, in terms of opportunistic uh, what we called opportunistic illnesses. We, we wanted to include a few cancers in there as well as infections. So instead of c calling it opportunistic infections, we broadened that to say opportunistic illnesses. Uh, and uh, so, but to make sure that it was very specific, we uh, wanted to be sure that each of those opportunistic illnesses was uh, accurately diagnosed. So we, we specified the diagnostic methods for those conditions. Uh, usually they had to be based on uh, a biopsy or, uh, or a, a culture. Um, and uh, so this actually left out what turned out to be a substantial proportion of, of people who had this con uh, illness whose opportunistic disease was diagnosed in another way, not so specifically, not so accurately, what you might call presumptively. And, uh, uh, but physicians who became more experienced with AIDS cases eventually, increasingly, made presumptive diagnoses for these opportunistic illnesses. So if we didn't want to miss cases, we had to broaden the case definition to include some of these illnesses that were diagnosed presumptively instead of definitively. And that's what we did in one of the revisions of the case definition. So, so in these early days, there was obviously was a, a real trade-off in the sense of, as you just, as you just discussed, you, the case definition was meant to be highly specific because you wanted to be as certain as you possibly could that anybody that was reported as a case represented a true case, that there, as you say, very detailed methods of diagnosis at that point in time, no presumptive diagnoses were accepted. Um, and no, and certainly that people didn't have other underlying reasons for their immuno immunodeficiency. That's right. So that's a, a good point. Uh, not only did you have to have one of these opportunistic illnesses, you must not have had any other known explanation for an immunodeficiency. But in uh, Such after as the, the cause, or yes, uh, and and this this actually became a, a a problem because it turned out that non-Hodgkin's lymphoma was one of those opportunistic illnesses, and on the other hand, op lymphoma can itself cause immunodeficiency. It can be an explanation for immunodeficiency. So I felt that we should not include lymphoma as an AIDS indicator. But other people said, but it's, a, it's occurring with mm -hmm. increased incidence in, in gay men. People who apparently have AIDS, they're getting lymphoma. And so we should make it an AIDS indicator. Uh, so, but fortunately, about that time, the cause of AIDS was discovered to be HIV. And antibody tests for HIV became available. So we, the way we changed the case definition uh, to include some additional conditions like lymphoma was we said, oh, we will count that as an indicator of AIDS, but only if the person has a positive HIV test. Right. And that was also true for the presumptive diagnoses of these opportunistic illnesses. They had to have a positive test for HIV. So the trade-off is, as you've 
articulated so well is that highly specific, so again, pre-discovery of HIV, we're pretty confident that these cases represent true AIDS, although it wasn't exactly called AIDS at the time. Right, and there and, were in but, fact cases that, we, that fit our case definition, because they had no apparent other explanation mm -hmm. for immunodeficiency, and yet we didn't think they really had AIDS. There were, for example, mm -hmm. uh, a man who had Kaposi's sarcoma. Uh, he was under 65 years old, so he fit the definition. He had no known cause of immunodeficiency, so he was an AIDS case, and yet we knew he really wasn't part of it. And there were other people who uh, were getting opportunistic infections like cryptococcal meningitis. These kinds of infections do occur, occur with a background incidence unrelated to any apparent immunodeficiency, but, but they're kind of rare. And so we knew we were included in our case definition some people who really were not part of it. But the flip side being, because it was so specific, it was not a terribly sensitive case definition. Again, this we're talking about these first definitions that were developed in the early 1980s. So, so the case definition obviously didn't capture the true spectrum of what, as years evolved, what we knew as HIV-related disease. I think That's the right. famous phrase was, the case definition was capturing the tip of an iceberg. That's right. In fact, that's what you worked on. Uh, that's right. I had the, a project. The Spectrum of Disease the Project. The Spectrum of Disease. Back, in, back at the time that you were struggling with this first case definition and trying so carefully to come up with this list of credible opportunistic infections, was there a sense already back then that there was a wider spectrum, that there were people that didn't have full-blown AIDS, but had milder yes. illnesses. So it, it, it was called, there was something that was called AIDS-related uh, uh, syndrome or it? complex. That's yeah. right, AIDS-related right. complex. And it consisted of uh, things like lymphadenopathy. But lymphadenopathy is a very nonspecific condition. And so you can't really be sure that it's part of the epidemic. It, Although, if it, if it occurs in a gay man, you could say, aha, it's probably part of it, but, but you can't really be sure. So, uh, we didn't make these part of the very specific case definition, even though we knew we were leaving out a lot of people who might have it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you uh, a question, um, and, and you, may, it, you may not uh, know, but... Uh, I was wondering if you could shed any light on how the name AIDS, or Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, came about. I've seen reports that, uh, that at a meeting in July 1982 in Washington, D.C., I'm not sure what the meeting was about, but there were federal officials and researchers and community activists. It was at this meeting somehow that the name Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or AIDS, was selected. Do you know anything more about that? No. It, it seems like it's a reasonable name, though, because before that there were congenital immunodeficiency syndromes, and in fact there were acquired immunodeficiency mm -hmm. syndromes that, uh, that means that they were not congenital, so you acquired them after you were born. Uh, but they were not the acquired uh, immunodeficiency syndrome. So now that that term means only AIDS as we currently understand it, rather than the earlier immunodeficiencies mm -hmm. that also had that term. Um, had been but, people been struggling for kind of a name? Because KSOI yes. was well, kind I, of well, and I, I was. I read last night. Uh, uh, a, a, an interview from with that had been done with Jim Curran, and he explained that w that he intentionally uh, gave the name of his task force uh, this long, com awkward name of Kaposi sarcoma and opportunistic infections because he wanted to make a point that these two conditions, a cancer and an infection, were actually part of the same epidemic. 
So that's why it, w it had that awkward name. And uh, it was also awkward for our secretaries who answered the telephone to say uh, who they were, you know, who, what the office was. So instead of saying Capacy's sarcoma and operative, they would just say Capacy's. <laughs> <laughs> And so people would know what the rest of it was. Uh, and it, it, ironically, it turned out that Kaposi's sarcoma became a decreasing part of the epidemic. It, it, it's only a tiny percentage now of, of AIDS cases. Uh, most of them are just infections, not Kaposi's sarcoma. Um, that is kind of ironic. So, but the, how we got the new term of acquired immune deficiency syndrome, I think it just makes sense that we, we realized that this was an immunodeficiency. People were getting the cancer and the infect opportunistic infections because they had an underlying immunodeficiency that was, and, and afterwards we realized it was caused by HIV. Mm -hmm. um, so that made sense. Um, however, I, I have an anecdote that uh, that it could cause problems to give it that name because um, the term AIDS actually has other meanings. And um, one time I was being interviewed on the radio uh, and I was, uh, somebody asked me, on the, the person on the radio uh, wanted to know why it's, it seemed like uh, gay men were at much higher risk than uh, than heterosexual women, and, and I started to speculate that maybe the uh, mucosa of the rectum might be more uh, liable to damage because it's just a single layer of columnar epithelium compared with the multi-layer squamous epithelium of the vagina. And uh, so after I finished rambling about that, they had an advertisement on the radio for a dietary supplement called AIDS, A-Y-D-S. They said, get AIDS, you will lose weight with AIDS. And uh, after, shortly after that, that company went out of business. Wow, talk about product placement. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you've alluded to, the case definition over time has undergone uh, many revisions, and, and, and I wanna get to that, but park that it for the moment because I still want to keep us a little bit in 1982, 1983. And so hand in hand with a case definition is obviously surveillance, a surveillance system to, to capture the cases that are being reported. Uh, and so were, were you actively involved, um, obviously working very hard on, your, on the definition, but did you start to get also involved at the same time on the mechanics of reporting and a surveillance system? Because uh, case reports started to be, I well, think, called I, in. Yes, they. In fact, a lot. Some of them were called in to me on the telephone. In the beginning, case reports were called in directly by healthcare providers, mm -hmm. by physicians, and we would write the patient's name on the case report form, um, and. When I started at, uh, on the task force, uh, there were only 340 some cases, but and when the cases came in, I was responsible for checking the case report forms to see if they met the case definition. And, and it, after not very long, I was being inundated I, uh, with case report forms. It was very hard to keep up with them. And uh, it, it felt like I was on, on top of a volcano that was going to explode. Uh, so, uh, but uh, fortunately, uh, we had Mead Morgan, our computer expert, who designed uh, a software system, uh, a database, that uh, eventually allowed us to automate the process so that uh, we could have uh, people who would key punch data enter the information from the case report form and the, the computer would tell them whether the case definition was met or not. So we didn't have to 
have an individual look at the case report for them and say uh, whether it, it fits or not. Yeah, it's probably challenging for people in 2016 to imagine a time when we didn't have computers and uh, to help us. But in 1982, you're dealing with paper forms that initially, as you said, people would phone into Atlanta and you and others would fill out the form and then check them manually to see if they were complete, met the case definition and the like. Do you remember how long it took before this got automated? It must have been a few years at yes, least. Yes, it, it took uh, a few years. So how did you do tabulation of statistics? Because obviously CDC was putting out MMWRs and journal well, publications and yeah. tabulating well, numbers. We, we did have the mainframe computer, and we so the data could be key punch data entered into a data uh, file using that, and we used the SAS uh, software for analyzing the data. When you came to CDC, when you started to work on the task force, did you have a lot of already computer skills, or no. did you have to kind of learn on the job? No. When I first came to CDC, uh, people had to use uh, IBM punch cards, and, uh, and, and it was very difficult to get access to the computer. You ha and uh, I can remember before I started working on AIDS, when I was in the Family Finding Evaluation Division, I didn't even bother to, to use the mainframe. I, I, I would have a bunch of paper forms and I, I would sort them out on the floor and try to count things that way very manually. <laughs> um, but uh, eventually, I think it was around 1983 or so, we got IBM PCs. And uh, this was a blessing really because up till then, uh, well, uh, Everything we wrote, or the articles that, or letters that we wanted to write, we would have to write with a pen and paper and hand to a secretary. And it was inevitable that the secretary would always make a mistake when she would type things out. I'd, I'd correct the mistake, hand it back. She would, she would correct that mistake, it would come back with another mistake. But when we got these IBM PCs with word processors, we could do away with the secretary and, and type everything ourselves. So it was, that was great. Well, having worked in the early 80s on AIDS surveillance in New York City myself, I have uh, vivid memories of receiving uh, handwritten notes on lined paper from you, Richard. Yes. Uh, in, in your very precise print, uh, querying us about uh, case report forms that had incomplete or uh, information that uh, right. didn't seem correct. So, so you really uh, uh, pre, pre uh, not even didn't even use a typewriter. That's right. The communication was uh, longhand or pr by pen and paper. And uh, in New York City, they were keeping track of my uh, questions, as you know. In a, in a log book that they would call the Dear Richard book, because dear, because that was a, a greeting in, in a letter you know, that you would That's might right. you get. You always started them off. Yeah, as dear. and but and years later, <laughs> people thought that that was uh, named after Benjamin Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac. They didn't know that it would, there was a real person, me, that was the basis for that. <laughs> the man behind the scenes. Well, obviously, at some point, CDC had to move from conducting surveillance via telephone reports coming in from health departments or uh, physicians to a, a system that was really situated in local and state health departments. Can you give us some sense of what it was like to more or less establish a new surveillance system from scratch? Um, well, this is something that Jim Curran uh, and David Sensor, uh, who was the head of the New York City Health Department at the time, uh, thought was appropriate at the time because they thought as we learn more about this illness, 
it, it's no longer simply an outbreak investigation, but instead be becomes part of the uh, ongoing surveillance that health departments need to do, similar to the surveillance of syphilis or uh, other communicable diseases, so that, uh, and, and for those conditions, um, names are not reported to CDC. Instead, the health department, if anybody, keeps those names, and uh, so that, uh, and, and physicians don't report cases of venereal disease to, directly to CDC. They report them to the health department. So there was a big change in how surveillance was done for AIDS. It, it no longer were physicians reporting cases directly to CDC. Now they had to report them by state or local regulation uh, to the, the state or local health department. And the health department, in turn, would forward the information to CDC, but without uh, identifiers like the name, for example. Uh, so, and CDC uh, kept track of, of the, uh, to avoid duplicate uh, counting of cases, we had to have some alternative to the name, so uh, we started to use uh, what uh, was the New York City Soundex, Actually, New York State has a different system for alphanumeric um, uh, representation of the last name, but, but New York City was using what, what we called Soundex. And uh, so that became a substitute for the last name. It, it's a, a four-character uh, uh, code that starting with the first letter of the last name, and then using three n numerical digits to represent consonants in the last name. And it was assumed that you could not reconstruct the last name based on knowing the Soundex code, so that it would be acceptably uh, secure and confidential to report to CDC just the Soundex code. And we, so we use that together with the date of birth and the sex, and also the, uh, the person's state of residence at the time of diagnosis as a way of making sure that we were not counting the same person more than once. And um, so if it looked like uh, they, all of those variables agreed on two different reports, even though they were sent by two different uh, uh, people, we would automatically assume they were the same person. Uh, and but then, people moved around. Yes. Because people could be reporting and from multiple states. So if states. they moved to another state, and this is what I think you're getting to, uh, and we got a report from a different state, apparently saying that the person was diagnosed in that other state, but sharing the same Soundex code, date of birth, and sex as uh, another person that had been reported to us, then we would have those two health departments communicate with one another to resolve the question of, is this the same person or not? And, and uh, so that has become part of the routine procedures that we use on a regular basis to uh, avoid overcounting uh, cases. Now, I think an before Soundex, before the Soundex codes were implemented, there there was a period of time, correct me if I'm wrong, where names yes. were sent to CDC. Yes. But this became a big cause for concerns, issues around confidentiality. Can you talk a little bit about what the concerns were about named reporting? Yes. Coming uh, to well, Atlanta? because these were names of people uh, who not uh, who ha not only be had diseases that could be something they would like to hide, but also be the risk factors that they had for a acquiring these diseases were stigmatizing, such as being a, a gay man or being an injection drug user. Uh, these were conditions that uh, were considered by many people not only to be immoral, but also in many states they were illegal. 
So uh, having this information get out would really put those people in danger. They were, there were fears that the federal government might use the information to round them up or quarantine them or, or do something else bad to them. So for that reason, they didn't want the federal government to know exactly who these people were. On the other hand, there were others who said they, would, they didn't want the state or local health department to know either because in, the people in the smaller towns in particular, uh, they felt that people in the health department would recognize who they were. They, they would know them on a personal basis. So they didn't want them to know either. Um, so it, in a lot of the states um, decided they weren't going to collect names either. They were just going to use a coded identifier the way we were using it. And they were, would hope that they wouldn't have duplicate case counts either. But CDC was not happy about that. They, CDC felt that the names must be kept at least at the state or local level, even if CDC doesn't get the names, because otherwise there would be a problem of not knowing exactly whether this person, this, the report uh, applies to two different people or whether multiple reports apply to the same person. So eventually, uh, we made it part of our requirements for funding of surveillance programs that they had to have name-based reporting. I see. So in the early 1980s, 82, 83, um, many of the cases at that time were initially being reported from places like New York City, San Francisco. but. Obviously, as we know, over time, the epidemic spread across the country. And I'm sure that some of these areas had on their own sort of developed procedures as to how they did case um, uh, reporting and maybe even had their own data forms. How did CDC try and ensure that there was uniformity, at least, in how states or large cities were conducting surveillance in those early days. Were there, did CDC um, develop manuals or, or guidance procedures? Were there technical training sessions? Yes, well, not only did we have our formal case definition, but we also had a standard case report form with a list of variables or data elements that uh, the, that the state health departments or local health departments that we were funding were required to collect data on. And uh, to help them do that, uh, to, uh, to help them set up their surveillance program, we also had a written uh, guidance for them on how to do surveillance uh, with uh, suggestions on how they should uh, contact hospitals and and physicians to uh, to search for cases or, or to collect additional information about cases um, and uh, for example one way they could search for cases would be to uh, go to a hospital and ask the medical record librarian to provide them with a list of patients whose discharge diagnoses had uh, codes, international uh, classification of disease c codes, or what we call ICD codes, uh, that were for the, any of the opportunistic illnesses that might be indicative of AIDS. And eventually, the, there was also an ICD code created for HIV infection itself. Uh, so if, if, it, if that, in particular, was one of the codes for the discharge diagnosis, then this represented a person that the, uh, the uh, health department surveillance staff needed to be aware of. They needed to check to see if this person had previously been reported to them. And if not, then this represented a new case that they needed to investigate and collect data on. So what you just described, health departments 
going to hospitals, trying to liaise with medical records departments or potentially physicians, say infectious disease physicians in a hospital, that was what we would call a more active approach to surveillance. Yes. Um, but there's also what we call the passive approach. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the differences between active and passive surveillance? Right. And were health departments doing a little bit of both? Yes. Uh, especially because we wanted to, them to capture cases that uh, might be just uh, s scattered here and there at uh, diagnosed at physicians' offices rather than concentrated in a big hospital, uh, we needed to enable them to have reports, uh, to receive reports passively that would be reported to them by physicians. So it, these the health departments uh, made regulations or made or they had the state legislature make it a, a state law that physicians had to report AIDS. Eventually, they included HIV infection in the absence of AIDS as well. Um, so physicians were legally required to report these to the health department. And this fact was, um, was brought to the attention of physicians at uh, at speeches given at at meetings of the state medical association, for example, uh, or by or there might be pamphlets mailed to physicians uh, to explain their obligation to report cases uh, to them. So, uh, so these were activities that CDC recommended to health departments that they do to uh, to. Uh, so to promote uh, what you might call passive surveillance, that it means receiving rather than actual, actively searching for uh, reports of cases. I know in New York City, having worked there for CDC in 82 to 84, that as interested as the physicians, both in inpatient and outpatient settings were, in AIDS and the importance of, of having accurate and complete case counts, um, it's, it's really hard <clears throat> to, uh, to maintain your, your motivation to do passive reporting. Fatigue just sets in. I mean, these are busy people and it's, yes. it takes time to pick up a phone and call. That's right. Physicians were reluctant to do this. In fact, uh, physicians that you might expect to report cases like uh, at major uh, academic medical centers in New York City, uh, they would be discussing cases uh, and and with, uh, and uh, and it turned out that one of them would say, "Oh, whether they had been reported or not," and they'd say, "Well, we have this many cases here," and the person from the health department would say, "We didn't receive that many." reports from you, and then uh, one physician would say, oh, I thought the other physician reported it. You know, each one thought the other guy was reporting it. And, or maybe they thought that the primary care provider who had referred the, the patient to the tertiary medical care center was the one who had reported the case. So not only did physicians not know whether uh, the case had been previously reported, but, but a lot of them, as you say, were too busy to report cases. Uh, and even if they reported a case, they were too busy to collect all the data elements that we were asking for on the case report form. So uh, they can delegate this to a nurse. Or at hospitals, they, this was generally delegated to the infection control specialist, usually a nurse uh, who would uh, go around to uh, to check on patients who, with serious infections in the hospital. As you know, in New York City, um, because of the very issues that you raise, the health department in early 1983 received the first CDC, what was called Cooperative Agreement Award, to implement a system of active base 
uh, active hospital-based surveillance in a subset of New York City hospitals because what we learned that even the infection control nurses were becoming overwhelmed with their regular duties as well as being asked to fit into their time and schedule um, uh, the responsibility of filling out case report forms and then transmitting them to the health department. So we piloted this active system of surveillance in hospitals, again at the time because there was no treatment. Uh, nearly all cases ultimately made their way to a hospital for requiring uh, intensive therapy and or um, sadly would die in hospital. But to do that took money. Exactly. And so can you talk a little bit about this because, because the, to this day I believe CDC system of aid surveillance is an incredibly well-funded system of surveillance. Well, that, some would argue they need more money, but uh, uh, it's true that uh, in many institutions, the infection control nurse uh, felt overwhelmed, and she had other duties uh, that she had to do, so that uh, she may not have had time for, to, to collect data on all the AIDS cases or HIV cases that were in her hospital. So uh, the CDC, through the, its cooperative agreements, was able to provide funding to the state or local health department, which then was able to hire staff, uh, people who became HIV or AIDS surveillance specialists, who would then go to the health care provider and, uh, to, and, and then the health care provider would, would pro give them access to the medical records and say, here, you fill out your case report forms so we don't have to do it. <laughs> so uh, that freed up the health care provider to uh, removing the burden of filling out case report forms uh, and delegating that to the uh, HIV surveillance staff from the health department. But that's obviously pretty expensive, um, and I, I'm sure systems of surveillance have changed over time, but to this day, CDC still provides substantial funding to state and local health departments to do HIV AIDS surveillance, is that correct? Yes. They do, yeah. So, so um, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a legacy that continues. Um, let me talk a little bit about um, I said we'd get back to it, the evolution of the case definition. So when we first talked about it, 1982, this painstaking work to try and come up with a specific case definition, no HIV test, virus hasn't even been discovered, so there's no laboratory test apart from measuring T cells that can assist you in making a diagnosis. But obviously, over time, things change. I know this, this could be an interview in and of itself, but can you briefly walk us through some of the major changes in the evolution of the case definition from the early 80s to the present day and the kinds of things that triggered the need for changes in the case definition? R right. Uh, the prime mover or the main factors that led to changes uh, were technological advances, but also uh, we were influenced by uh, demands from the public or from activist groups, you might say, to some extent. Uh, so let me first talk about the technological advances. Uh, in the beginning, not only did we not have a, a test for HIV, we didn't, even the tests for the immunodeficiency were not widely available. If they had been widely available at the beginning, we might have based the case definitions solely on a test for immunodeficiency. But it wasn't widely available, so instead we used the opportunistic illnesses, the manifestations of the immunodeficiency. So then after the test for HIV became available, we increased the number of different diseases that 
we used as indicators of AIDS, but only if accompanied by a positive HIV test. And uh, we had uh, what you might call lobbyists or people who would argue in support of adding certain diseases to the case definition. Uh, so uh, we had people saying well, we should include pulmonary TB. And uh, that, I thought, was a problem because, as you know, pulmonary TB can occur in the absence of immunodeficiency. So if we... In Somebody, if we include somebody with TB, how can you be sure that uh, it was due to AIDS rather than any, that he would not have developed TB in the absence of AIDS? Uh, but this persisted, and articles showed that the incidence of pulmonary TB was several times greater in persons who had uh, HIV infection than among people without HIV infection. So eventually we did include pulmonary TB as part of the case definition. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, uh, lymphoma uh, was a problem because lymphoma itself is a cause of immunodeficiency, mm -hmm. non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And the case definition was supposed to exclude people with known causes of immunodeficiency um, at least the, the early case definition did, but once we had a test for HIV infection, then we said, okay, we will allow uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma to be an indicator of AIDS as long as the person was known to have a positive HIV test. So that's an example of advances in technology. And, and also we allowed uh, presumptively diagnosed opportunistic diseases to serve as indicators of AIDS as long as they had a positive HIV test. Another development was that uh, the tests for immunodeficiency in the form of uh, what we call CD4 counts that refers to the uh, type of lymphocyte that is attacked by HIV, the T uh, CD4 lymphocyte, that um, when a person has AIDS, the number of those CD4 cells are decreased. So uh, eventually we said another indicator of AIDS that we could use as, in, as a substitute for having an opportunistic illness is a low CD4 count, specifically a count below 200 cells per microliter. So, uh, so when we did that, this opened the floodgates. We su suddenly got lots more reports of people with low CD4 counts who now qualified mm -hmm. as having AIDS and before, before they had any opportunistic illness. So when we did, when we changed the case definition in this way, this is good in some ways but bad in, a, in other ways because now we could uh, capture cases that we were missing and so it would be more accurate in that sense, at least going forward, but by expanding the case definition so drastically, it made it more difficult to follow the epidemic trend because the number of cases skyrocketed suddenly when we case, when we, just because we changed the case definition. So is that because the epidemic is getting worse or is it just because we changed the definition? Uh, it's hard to tell. So, but, uh, so this is, changing the case definition like that is not something a person should generally do when we, you're following an epidemic trend, but, but we felt we had to do it in order to capture a, a, a larger percentage of the iceberg, as you might call it, that, because if you look only at diagnosed opportunistic infections, that's just the tip of the iceberg. So, uh, and then, uh, after uh, we had, uh, after this had been going on for a while, well, I should add that there, there were these lobbyists, uh, not only for their favorite infectious disease or favorite kind of cancer to be added to the case definition, but also uh, patient groups, patient organizations, uh, uh, for particularly uh, women uh, were, felt they were being left out because they felt there were certain illnesses that only women got uh, 
that uh, were worse in women who had HIV or occurred more frequently in women with HIV than in women who did not have HIV. And so they thought those illnesses, for example, uh, cervical cancer or pelvic inflammatory disease, or uh, that they should be added to the case definition. Well, so we, uh, we gave in to a certain extent to that. Uh, uh, we, we added invasive cervical cancer. Um, and that in itself was somewhat controversial because there was some skepticism of whether that was really due to HIV because in Africa, where the epidemic was severe, nobody had noticed an increase in the incidence of cervical cancer at that time. So that made it seem unlikely that it was causing cervical cancer. Uh, but uh, s nonetheless, we added invasive cervical cancer to the list. And even though we had done that, for some reason uh, in the uh, WHO's uh, list of conditions that they would count as indicative of AIDS um, and, and deserve uh, an, an ICD, International Classification of, of Diseases, uh, code number for uh, HIV infection, uh, they did not include cervical cancer. I don't know why. I think maybe now they should change it to include it. but. Um, so we, we uh, but we did not include pelvic inflammatory disease uh, or cervical dysplasia, which is an earlier form of cervical cancer, because we felt those were too nonspecific, and they and we wanted the case definition to be relatively specific. Uh, so I, I think does that answer your question? Yeah. So if I re recall correctly, the the shift to um include as cases of AIDS persons who had CD4 T lymphocyte counts less than 200 came in about 1993. And there was, uh, I think the last revision just occurred a couple years ago, 2014. Yes. And that was based on, I think, new diagnostic tests. The diagnostic tests have gotten better. and the need not to have confirmatory Western blot tests? Well, um, uh, I don't think the case definition necessarily specified which type, of, maybe it did, I forget, uh, whether it had to be a Western blot or not. Uh, the problem was that, um, yeah, uh, that the way, I think we said it had to be a confirmatory test, Correct. okay? That's right. And, and at the time, Western blot was the confirmatory test. Uh, but the problem w recently has been that the Western blot was being replaced with a kind of test that is not always used only as a confirmatory test. It could also be the initial test. So we couldn't tell whether it was being used as an initial test or a confirmatory test, and we felt you needed to have two tests, an initial test and a confirmatory test, to be sure that the person had HIV infection. And so with these new tests, we said, okay, well, now we're changing the case definition, so you at least have to have two different antibody tests, not not simply a confirmatory test, because we don't, we don't know whether that test was actually being used as a confirmatory test. So that was the, I think, the main change. So lots of changes over time. What's generally the process that you go through to change a case definition? It sounds pretty arduous. It used arduous. to be very <laughs> simple and easy. We do it, you know, back in the early 80s, we'd say, we'll just make this change and, and do it. <laughs> And, but the afterwards, uh, uh, we had to go through some kind of clearance process, and, and we had to uh, have a, a national meeting. Uh, yes, where uh, experts from around the country would come and, and give their opinions about whether a certain change should be made in the case definition. So it was almost like pack, passing an act of Congress. 
Do you pilot test in any sort of way before you do a full rollout of a new case definition? Is it possible to even do that? Uh, to some extent, uh, we try to do that uh, based on data that have already been reported to us, but to t in other ways, no, it isn't possible. Now, you, you mentioned this, and I was wondering if uh, you could elaborate a little bit more. Obviously, these changes impacted the ability to follow trends in disease and mortality. Through modeling and whatever, are there ways to try and now still get a sense of trending? Are we going up, down, staying the same? Well, modeling is not my expertise. I'm, I'm not sure how uh, mo this, it is done. It's mm -hmm. a, you, you need a, a statistician who's an expert in modeling to give you the details in that. But yes, we did a lot of modeling. There's something we called back calculation that was used uh, to, uh, to examine the numbers of AIDS cases and on the basis of those to calculate backwards the number of, or, or not only the number, but when the person who, who ha who's a had an AIDS diagnosis on a particular date, when they had uh, HIV infection, when they first became infected. Uh, so that way we, we would get a better uh, idea of when the HIV infections were occurring, if you believe the model. Um, and also, uh, in terms of just what was reported to us, uh, we had to adjust for delays in reporting, because if you don't make that adjustment, then when you look at the number of cases that were reported in the most recent few months, it, they will always look smaller than the number that eventually get reported. Uh, talking in terms of, uh, say, the number that were diagnosed last year, okay? So uh, a lot of those cases that were diagnosed in the last year are still being reported this year. So if, if you uh, they haven't been reported completely yet, and if you do an analysis, uh, it'll look like the number of cases uh, for, that were diagnosed last year uh, is a lot lower than the number that were diagnosed the previous year. It looked like the epidemic's mm -hmm. going down. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, a, that's a, 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 probably a, a falsehood simply because of the delay, delay in reporting. So we used a statistical adjustment based on the, the rates at which, uh, looking at the interval between um, the diagnosis date and the report date that as it had been for the preceding five years to f anticipate what that delay would be for last year or uh, in the future. And m with using that, we come up with a, a statistical weight that we applied to the numbers that to uh, adjust them upwards so that they would estimate the number that eventually uh, would be reported for uh, that had been diagnosed on a particular year. And of course, I'm, there are now also I'm, other ways to monitor the epidemic apart from counting cases of AIDS because there's seroprevalence surveys and things like that that can help us well, get a sense of yes. The now, status. before I get into seroprevalence, let me also say that recently and I don't completely understand the reasons for it, there has been a decision made not to adjust for reporting delay. Oh. And I, I don't know what's going to happen, uh, whether this is being done because we now think that reporting is, is happening so soon after diagnosis that there, there is not much of a delay that needs to be adjusted. Or it may be that politicians just don't uh, trust uh, adjustments. They think maybe we're... Uh, faking the numbers or something? I, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, we'll see what happens in the future because the, the next report that comes out will not have that adjustment for reporting delay. Uh, now, regarding the seroprevalence studies, these were done um, in uh, sentinel populations. Uh, at various hospitals were selected to sample uh, blood specimens that were routinely drawn in all their patients. Uh, 
to see what percentage of them were, were positive for HIV. But the way this was done uh, uh, protected the confidentiality of all these patients uh, so that the CDC did not receive the names, and in fact, not even mm -hmm. the, the local health department received the names uh, that belonged to these samples of blood that came from different population groups across the country. Uh, and uh, so this was an alternative way of measuring uh, the epidemic in terms of the prevalence of HIV in the population. Um, but, um, and, and one of the groups or one of the populations that were being sampled were, were newborn babies. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, if a newborn baby is found to have a positive test, it doesn't necessarily mean that baby is infected uh, just based on a positive antibody test because uh, for the first several months after birth, those antibodies that the babies have very likely just came from the mother. They were passed, were transferred from the mother's blood to the baby's blood and, and would eventually go away if the baby was not really infected. Um, if the baby was infected, the baby would start making its own antibodies, and which would persist in the baby's blood. But so, so what the test was really telling you was not whether the baby was infected, but whether the mother was infected. And so there were some confidentiality issues again. The, uh, it, it, it was felt that, well, we shouldn't, for the seroprevalence study, we're, we're not collecting the name of the mother or the baby. We're just trying to measure the prevalence in the population. And there was a, an objection to this because mm -hmm. some politician in New York City, I think it was, complained that it didn't seem right to have information that could tell the mother that she was infected, uh, that then she could do something about that infection. Uh, and so uh, sh she was about to do something in, in, in terms of legislation to prohibit this. And, and Jim Curran uh, preempted this by saying, okay, we're going to discontinue uh, the, that kind of seroprevalence zero study. Now we're only going to have name-based uh, testing, so we'll know who that mother is, and she can get the proper intervention to, she can get treated, the baby mm -hmm, can get mm -hmm, treated, mm -hmm. and uh, so that they can be handled uh, properly. Uh, but the, the problem, though, is e that even though there was a law passed to mandate newborn HIV testing in New York, that kind of law did not exist in all the other states. So we lost all that information on the newborns from the other states, and those newborns were not gaining any benefit from, they weren't being tested. Tested, right. Yes. So it's fine to do testing in a way that would tell the individual whether they're infected and give that individual uh, treatment, but I think that should go in parallel with uh, having an uh, anonymous uh, random sampling that is not based on, where you don't know the name of the person, mm -hmm. just to have accurate measurement of the prevalence in the population. Because if, if you insist on having the name, if, then it has to be voluntary. That's you right. have to ask right. the per patient's permission to be tested. Right. And a lot of the patients would might say, no, thank you, I don't want to be mm -hmm. tested. And then you wouldn't be able to get an accurate measurement of the prevalence. Right. So from, so from a sort of pure statistical lens, uh, obviously the, the doing it in an anonymous way gives you better data, but obviously not possible to do. Uh, so, well, Richard, I, am I correct in thinking that you're the only person currently working in CDC's AIDS uh, activities that's been there essentially from the very beginning? Well, again, I joined in 82, and the beginning was yeah. in 81, but that's pretty close to the beginning. To and what do you attribute your staying power? Well, Well, now, Harold Jaffe <laughs> is still there. But not, but not actually working in AIDS. I mean, right. I think of you as being yeah. the, the reference point for, for all of us, that you've 
have been associated with very directly the AIDS program or division as the name changed over time since 1982. I don't think there's anybody else that's been affiliated with the program directly uh, as long as you have. Right. Well, the work is still interesting to me. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not as though it's sta that mm -hmm. it has stayed the same. In, in fact, things keep changing all the time. The technology advances, mm -hmm. there are new challenges, and uh, so it, it remains interesting to me. And uh, I'm, I'm still learning things from it. Uh, so, so that, uh, you might say, is the carrot that kept me there. <laughs> And the stick might be that I, I might not have felt comfortable doing something else that I didn't know anything about. But because I, I feel like I do at least know something about this area. Well, I, th I think CDC has been uh, uh, very fortunate to have, have you uh, uh, there for, from almost the beginning and, and still carrying on. Um, any closing thoughts before we end our conversation? Things looking back almost 35 years, things that... Well, I wanted to say that uh, it's been amazing how uh, HIV surveillance has taken advantage of advances in technology. Many of these adv advances seem to have become available fortuitously just in, when they were needed. For example, mm -hmm. And, and I'm talking not just about surveillance, but about uh, the uh, scientific investigations of HIV. For example, uh, it, the science of retrovirology was developed just around the time that AIDS was discovered. So it, it was there in the nick of time. And uh, there were advances in uh, storage of massive amounts of data on computers that became available sort of just in the nick of time. Um, and in terms of, uh, uh, well, medications, uh, people have, uh, NIH has found drugs that, that were effective. That, uh, and so a lot of these advances uh, were made because people actively searched for new, uh, new things they could use for HIV and also, uh, also using old things in a new way. For example, AZT used to be a drug for cancer, but it was found that it could also be useful for fighting HIV. Uh, so it's just uh, impressive how uh, technology has uh, changed over time and how HIV uh, science and surveillance has made use of it. Um, also, uh, in, in record linkage, I mean, uh, sort of computer processes, uh, co this includes uh, databases like the National Death Index, for example, which started in 1979, again, just around the time of the AIDS epidemic. Mm -hmm. We are now conducting record linkage with the National Death Index to find deaths of people in the case registries so, mm -hmm. uh, who, have, uh, uh, who had uh, HIV infection, so we can keep track of this. And we're also doing record linkages with the Social Security Death Master file, although that, that's somewhat less informative. Uh, to, to capture deaths that uh, might be missed from the National Death Index. So, and the ability to conduct record linkages itself uh, is only recent uh, in, in terms of massive numbers because uh, record linkage software uh, was developed only in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Oh, really? and, and it has been very expensive, for prohibitively expensive, until CDC developed its own version of record linkage software. Uh, it actually, it was through, it was sponsored by the Cancer Surveillance Branch, um, and uh, 
So we have borrowed that software to use in HIV surveillance. So we use it uh, to conduct the linkages, not, not only with the Social Security Death Master file, uh, but, I mean, and this is done not by CDC, by the way, because uh, we don't get the names of people. It is done by the state health departments. Okay. Uh, so we, we, tell, we provide this record linkage software uh, to the state health department so they can l do the linkages, not only with the death files, but also with um, other databases uh, where they might find cases like, like uh, uh, the Ryan White Healthcare uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, or clinic databases, so they can search for cases and can, and and find information about uh, laboratory test results that way. So record linkage has been a great advance. Um, so I guess that's one thing I wanted to say uh, that, that we things have changed drastically over time. Um, and uh, another thing is that people's attitudes toward, uh, the, toward persons infected with HIV have changed drastically mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. as, as you know, that uh, at least in the minds of some people, um, uh, the perception of gay people has changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they uh, have come more out of the closet and uh, they are, have become uh, 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 they've been consultants to CDC. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're even uh, my, some of my coworkers are, are openly mm -hmm. gay, and and so the the perception and attitude, as everyone knows, in, in terms of the federal governments, uh, uh, has changed drastically uh, to uh, to look more favorably on gay people and, and, and be more accepting of them. Um, and uh, well, I think I'll stop there. Well, as you've highlighted, uh, with an epidemic that's now nearly 35 years uh, and counting, uh, there's been a lot of changes running in parallel with that, uh, be they technologically or uh, sociologically, um, politically, whatever. It's, it's been an interesting time, and you've had, a, you've had a ringside seat, Richard. Well, thank you so much for sharing um, your um, uh, history with us and, and shedding a, a light on uh, the surveillance activities that uh, CDC has been engaged in, and um, uh, wish you another 35 years. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you.